electric. The word itself is like kryptonite to petrol heads. It genuinely hurts us, not only because we believe it's not the final answer, but we're starting to feel alienated by the brands we love, who almost make us feel dirty for loving our combustion engine past. Now enters Porsche with the Taycan. Now let's be fair, most of these EVs deserve the cold shoulder from our gearhead community. The Teslas, for example, great straight line performance, questionable handling, questionable build quality, and again, a lack of soul. Then you look at something like the newer Mercedes EQC. The design went full retard. It's fat, it's got frankly forgettable driving and interior. Audi e-tron, at least it looks more like an Audi, but again, pretty soulless. And then BMW, who didn't even turn up after their escapades with the i8. At least their newer cars look like they could fit a large electrical socket within the front. And that brings us to Porsche, perhaps the last and best hope to make this whole EV thing work for us petrol heads. Now on paper, it seems really similar to the others, but Porsche claim it's got soul electrified. So let's find out with this new Taycan Turbo S. So guys, welcome back to RBR. I'm your host, Raz. Let's talk about the electric story of Porsche. It's a story that actually started well before the company was even founded. That is, if you credit the founder's achievements to Porsche. Now, Ferdinand Porsche was nothing if not an engineering genius. He was since a young age, a fact that his father hated, but he persevered. He used to commute to work as an electrical engineer on a bike upon which he installed on the rear wheel an electric motor to drive that rear wheel. So a pretty intelligent guy. His skills were noticed early on by Joseph Lorner and company, and together they built the first hybrid car in the world. And that was called the Semper Vivus, or Always Alive, loosely translated. Now this was a time when the combustion engine was not the be all and end all answer for these horseless carts. And it was a time for experimentation. And Ferdinand Porsche loved to look at things from zero. And his idea was to have two combustion engines powering two electric motors on the front axle. And this is very loosely similar to the hybrids that we have in Porsche today. So a very clever man indeed. Now there were later versions of this. The car was actually built by Porsche at the 918 launch as none existed. So it's great that there's an actual version of this sitting somewhere in Zuffenhausen. There were later versions done, built at Daimler in fact, and one of the first ever customers was Emil Jelinek who is more notoriously known for having bought so many Daimler cars that eventually they named a car after his daughter, Mercedes. That's my one Mercedes fact for this video. I'm out. So that was before Porsche even started. And that was a very quick overview of the many things that Ferdinand did to push this idea of electrification. It's coming straight to the modern day era is the 918 Spider hypercar, a V8 hybrid that left no doubt of Porsche's aptitude to build hybrid and electric cars that were absolutely stunning with their performance. This was followed by proper racing cars like the 919 and a full rollout all over the Porsche range, creating cars like the Panamera Turbo SE Hybrid that we tested, loads of horsepower, great handling, and really showing the world that electrification and hybrid is not something that Porsche is afraid of and something that they can do exceedingly well before anyone else has. Then in 2015 came this the precursor, the Porsche Mission E concept. Now, how gorgeous was this when we first saw it? I mean, just look at it. It's got spaceship looks with that stormtrooper face, the suicide doors, and it's very Porsche-like still with the 911 shape, but with a hint of Star Wars, rather than having tacky blue trims all over the car like, say, BMW or Mercedes have done. It just looks like a really futuristic Porsche. And the fact that they released it in 2015 gave us quite a few years to digest the shape. And now when the Taycan has come, when we saw the prototypes flying around the ring, it looks very Panamera, which scared us, but they've really made a car that's very, very, very close to the concept. Now, first I want to tackle the name, Taycan. Now, both the Tai and the Khan bits are part of a Turkish language. And the Thai part means a young spirited horse, apparently. 
and the Khan part means soul. So it's loosely translated as the soul of a young spirited horse, which is nice when you consider that the Porsche Crest is of course the horse of Stuttgart and this is a young new technology. So I kind of like the name after hearing that explanation. But the first question that came to my mind was, why did they decide to go for a super sedan or a sports sedan or a sports car essentially, rather than the SUV that most manufacturers have been going for? And for this, I want to quote directly their designer, Michael Maurer, who said, at times we also considered launching into e-mobility with an SUV, but ultimately we made the decision to take this important step for Porsche with a sports car in order to make a clear statement. Now, I absolutely love that because Porsche's best-selling cars throughout their history have been the Cayenne and the Macan, but they ignored that. They didn't look at the bottom line. They didn't listen to the accountants. They instead listened to their customers. What do their core customers want? They want a sports car that looks like the 911. And that's exactly what Porsche delivered. It's exactly what a lot of manufacturers have ignored their customers' wishes on, building SUVs for soccer moms. And for that, Porsche deserves a round of applause. Now, normally I would split design and drivetrain into separate sections of the walkaround, but these sections come together because this is whole new territory for Porsche. Now, Mr. Mao also said that when they designed this car, they wanted to make it low like the 911. And when it's low, they wanted to have the right width as well. So this ratio of width versus height. And in order to achieve that, compared to most EVs, which are so tall because of the batteries, they created these foot garages where the cells lay around the occupants and thus giving us a really low seating position, but more importantly, giving you that classic shape of a 911 in this four door. Now you must see one of these in person because it's a lot smaller than the Panamera. Well, not a lot smaller, but significantly enough to make you think about 911. In fact, let's bring 911 here. Let's give it a set of extra doors essentially you've loosely got what the Taycan looks like, which is great. That's exactly what you want. You haven't got silly blue trim bits all over the car or fake vents or something over exaggerated in order to say, hey, this is the future. This is an EV. It just looks like a Porsche. Yes, albeit with some Porsche Active Aerodynamics slats here and there that are different to the combustion cars, but everything is there for a purpose. There's nothing there just for show. You look at the dead on rear view, it's the single bar Porsche light. You look at the dead on front, it looks very, very similar to something like the 918, something like the 911, albeit wider. You look at the side profile, it is very, very similar to 911. Essentially, it just looks like another Porsche in the lineup. It's not alienating you, it's welcoming you. Now that Mission E concept in terms of performance was very 2015, but it did show us the 800 volt system that will later come in the Taycan and the range figures have been achieved by Taycan today as well. But the performance is much higher as it should be. Let's first talk about the battery. We've got, of course, that 800 volt system. We've got 396 cells in this car, as we said, wrapped around those foot garages in order to give a very low seating position. The charging, because of the 800 volt system, is that much faster. The performance is that much more replicatable and reliable. You can charge these on an Ionity charger from 5% to about 80 in about 20 minutes, which is great if you've got the infrastructure for it. Indeed, you even look at the charging ports and the way that they open and close. It's not like it's an afterthought. It's done in such a integrated way, just as you would expect of Porsche. I think it's really well done. I do find the rear bumper a little bit plain. I'm not sure what else they could do with it, but then I'm not a car designer. I think at least something to be desired on the lower end, perhaps some more aggressive aero would help it. I'm not sure. I just feel on the rear, the dead rear, it's just missing something. It is very distinctly Porsche, however, on the road, and I do love the muscular shoulders that it has. I absolutely love the dip in the roof. This is one of the biggest reasons that I would give you not to go for the panoramic roof and keep with the standard roof. It gives just such a different profile when you're looking dead on on the car. It matches kind of the shape of the bonnet as well. It just all looks that much more tied together with that roof structure. The stance of the car itself is so wide. You see where the greenhouse ends and how much more car you have on each side after the glass. It looks more supercar. 
You really note the rear arches, you really note the front arches as well. The wheels are really large again, which helps with the stance. The car can be lowered significantly, again, helping with the stance. You've got lovely option of carbon fiber as well, which this car has, and you can see how nice the front end looks and the side skirts, really giving it an aggressive look. Looking at the wheels, again, the options are pretty cool. Unlike a lot of EVs, you get very much Mission E style ones as the top level ones, but it all looks very Porsche. And then you see the size of the ceramic sitting behind those wheels, particularly in this, the Turbo S version. But I don't think I've ever seen brake calipers that large on a car of this shape before. Now, of course, that large performance battery adds quite a lot of weight. This is a heavy car, but Porsche have still managed to achieve that perfect weight distribution of 49.51, which is damn impressive. So we've got two electric motors on this car, which is fairly standard, one in the front, one in the rear. The front is a single gear transmission, but what isn't standard and what is completely unique to Taycan is the two-speed transmission on the rear. So this is a completely unique Porsche innovation. The first gear handles the higher power, the launch control, and is generally used in Sport and Sport Plus, while the second gear handles the majority of everything else, including high-speed cruising. But what is a Porsche without the handling aspect? And that is where the Taycan should really shine off of paper and on the road. So of course, on the rear, we've got a limited slip differential. We've got Porsche 4D chassis control. We've got Porsche PASM with active analysis. We've got three camber air suspension like in the Panamera that can dip the car by up to 22 millimeters at high speeds. We have Porsche Torque Vectoring Plus, which is one of the main reasons that we get such good steering feel out of these cars. And then the Turbo S gains two things. It has rear wheel steering and it has Porsche Dynamic Chassis Control. Again, that's something that you would note the 911 Turbo S is having. So this has got all of those suspension and handling components that you would expect of a top level Porsche car. Now, Porsche wouldn't be a Porsche without a multitude of variants, right? And the Taycan already has quite a few. First is the newly announced 4S. This car gives you 523 brake horsepower, 640 newton meters of torque, and a zero to 60 of four seconds. You also get a maximum range of 315 miles, according to the official figures. But what's really interesting about this car is that it's 165 kg lighter than the turbo variants, which is very significant. So I'm looking forward to see how this feels versus these heavier turbo cars. Allegedly, there's also a rear wheel drive only version of the Taycan coming as well. Again, that might be lighter. Now you'll notice that weight difference means that there's difference within the actual internals of the cars as well. It's not just a matter of upping the software for the horsepower, and I'll get onto that in a minute. Next comes the turbo. 680 brake horsepower, 850 Newton meters, and a zero to 60 of three seconds. Again, very respectable in that car. Maximum range, again, we're looking at 290. And there's an interesting fact about the horsepower of this versus the Turbo S that I'm gonna tell you in a minute. Speaking of Turbo S, 760 brake horsepower and overboost, 1,050 Newton meters of torque, a figure I never thought I'd ever say on the channel, and a zero to 60 of 2.6 seconds, which is absolutely crazy. Maximum mileage is 250 miles, according to the official figures as well. The Turbo S gets some really good Porsche goodies though. You get the ceramics as standard, you get Porsche dynamic chassis control, as I mentioned, and the rear wheel steering, all of which are really gonna help the handling of this heavier car. Now, what is really interesting is both the Turbo and the Turbo S on the road actually deliver the same horsepower, which is 620. The other figures I told you of 680 and 760 only apply to the overboost on the launch control. So in daily driving, both Turbo and Turbo S are giving you the same power on the road. And as I said, there are different internals in these cars that stops you from simply doing a software update to increase the power of a 4S, say, to a turbo or a turbo to a turbo S. There's different rated inverters on the front axles of these cars that allow the turbo S to be that much more powerful than the others. So there are significant differences inside. Porsche have made a really big deal about replicatable performance in these cars as well. So launch control can be done with the exact same figures dozens of times, unlike the competitors where your speed and your response begins to wane as the car begins to heat up and lose energy. So this is a big selling point from Porsche's side on their EV. 
Looking to the future, there's also going to be a Sport Turismo version of the Taycan, as we've seen running around the Nürburgring. Looks pretty good, and I'm super happy that we're getting an estate version of this very, very fast Porsche. Now, let's head inside and have a look at the interior that is very, very familiar, just as I feel the outside is familiar to us as a Porsche. Now, sitting in Taycan, thanks to these foot garages, as they call them, you sit really quite low, and it's very reminiscent of 911 as soon as you get in the car. Now, when you look at the general structure of the interior in front of you, again, it all kind of links back. And I want to show you a specific view of the older 911s that we've seen on the channel and how, in particular, this part of the dashboard and this driver zone in their basic structure are very familiar to those cars. And that was kind of the basis for the design of this. Then you also get a lot of the 918 Spider like this raised center console, and more importantly, the gear selector, just like that car right up here in the exact same format, which is cool. So I love the seating position. I love how low you can get. I love how it feels like a 911, then you look back and you've got actual proper seats in the back. It's not like Panamera at all in that sense. It's very much a low slung sports car, which is great. Now the interior is very, very familiar. It's very Porsche. Again, you've not got things that are over-exaggerating the fact that it's an EV. It's just a slightly cleaner version of a modern Porsche interior. So you haven't got buttons and switches as such. You have instead haptic feedback on the two touch screens here. Sadly, this particular car hasn't got the passenger one that we've all heard about. We'll probably explore that at some point in the future. What we've got here is a centralized screen and another screen just above it as you would find in 992 or Panamera. Now, as I said, no switches, but you do have touch controls with haptic feedback, which is a bit safer. As you guys have heard from me in the past, I don't really like touchscreens. I don't find them safe. I like to feel where buttons are so I don't have to look down to operate them. It's just safer in a driving environment. But at least with this, at least you get the haptic feedback so you know that you're clicking onto something, which is at least some kind of safety. But the most important part for any driver has to be the driver's zone. You've got the lovely option of the GT Sport steering wheel with the race techs or Alcantara here, which is great, but that kind of falls to the background because you've got a lovely new driver display, a fully digital one for the first time. And it's in the same design as you would see in a classic 911. So you've got the circles there. You can't really see the bits on the side. Again, it's classic Porsche in that sense. You've also got haptic buttons, again, touch buttons on the side to control things like traction control, suspension, your lift mode. There's a shortcut there as well. And then the lights are on the other side. And then you can change the options for the screens in front. And this is a beautiful glass display. It's curved. It's very, very thin. You look at it from the top. It's just a piece of artwork. A bit I don't like, I don't like this kind of leather trimmed area that seems just a little bit rough around the screen, but generally, like everything that you see made by Porsche with interiors, it's all built like a tank. There's no squeaking, there's no big gaps in the panels, it's all just so tightly packaged together and trimmed beautifully. Now, of course, this is an EV, so this part of the center console is not taken up as it would be typically in an ICE car, so you've got a gap here, which is very pretty to look at from the side, but there's absolutely no storage in here which is a little bit strange. You've got your typical sports chrono watch there, as you would find, again, in every Porsche, which is nice. Door handles, very, very 992. Also 992 in the way that they want to chop your fingers off, so be careful with those. The infotainment in the Taycan has been completely redone specifically for this car. It's similar to 992 in Panamera, but it links this idea of using the lower screen and the screen above. So you have some shortcuts down here, for example, navigation, music, phone, and then car settings that allows you to easily access stuff in the top screen. And then you've got your climate control and whatnot in the lower screen down here. You've got your battery readout that you can easily access as well, opening the frunk. It's all quite easy to use. I like the fact we've got the haptic feedback. You've got a customizable home screen with three sections that you can customize in the main top screen here. And generally it's fairly easy to use. Again, I'm not a fan of complete touch, so I don't like reaching around while I'm driving, but then you have got the voice assistant as well as you have in many cars these days. So all you have to say is, hey, Porsche. How can I help you? Take me to Heathrow Airport. Please select a line number. So it's fairly simple, pretty easy to use in that way if you don't want to mess around with the touchscreen while driving. Got loads of headroom as the driver. The sports seats are brilliant both in the front and the rear, but they're just normal Porsche seats. In fact, everything in here just feels normal Porsche. Yes, it's very minimalistic. Yes, there's no buttons, but 
it's not like I'm being force fed some EV story. Just like the outside, yes, you've got the unique element of the EV design, but it still just looks like a normal Porsche. Similarly inside, you've got the basic structure of a classic 911 mixed with some touch screens, an updated driver zone, but generally it's just Porsche structure. And that's great because what you end up with is, yes, a futuristic looking Porsche, but above all else, a Porsche. Jumping in the back, I mean, I'm 5'10", I've got okay height. Okay, it does swoop down quite a bit. Sport Turismo is probably gonna be the one for more room in the back. Leg room isn't too bad. That's with my driving position as well. And the seats are pretty comfortable. Again, sports seats, so not a lot of wiggle room. But when you compare it to something like 911, which this shape of car reminds me of, you've got a lot more space than in that car. You've also got, again, another touch screen here for the passengers, mimicking the one in front to control your AC, etc., as well. And it all kind of melds together very harmoniously between the rear and the front. In terms of rear boot space, you've got a kind of narrow aperture in there, but pretty good to boot space for what is an EV. And don't forget, we of course also have space in the front. Typical space in the front, as you would find in a 911, probably a bit less actually. So a big fan of the interior of the Taycan. One thing I don't like in the car, in terms of the interior, are the buttons for park and the button to turn the car on. Now you don't need to use this button, but it kind of looks like something that you would find on an appliance, like a fridge or a washing machine. It's just a very large power button. Now I know it doesn't make sense to have an ignition switch on an EV, but I don't know. I, I prefer the idea where you can put your foot on the brake and just select the drive mode, which is another way of starting the car. It's a lot better than pushing that fridge button. Anyway, now I want to show you what this car is like. I actually had it for one day when we couldn't film it, so I got time to kind of live with the car and see what it was like. And I actually missed it until we got it back today. So when they talk about Soul Electrified, the only way for me to explain that to you properly is to show you. So guys, as we did with Turbo S, I think it's just as important with the Turbo S of the Taycan to do the launch control. 2.6 seconds, instant 1,050 Newton meters. What is this gonna be like? I'm equal parts terrified and excited. Let's try it out. Whoa! <laughs> Oh my god! <laughs> what a oh that, that that was just immense. That felt potentially twice as quick as what the Turbo S did when I tried it here not a few weeks ago. I think part of that must be that enormous amount of torque that you just get straight away because you know no gears, no nothing of the sort. It's all available straight away, especially when you're doing launch control because you've got the whole overboost thing. So that was 760 brake horsepower going to the wheels, no loss of traction. Uh, it's, it's like a roller coaster. <laughs> Incredible. Now the other thing that I really love about this car and I want to talk about it before we do the full performance review. Let's come to a stop here. And you'll note, both inside and out, we've got a bit of a sound going on. Now that is, in part, what the car actually makes. And if you turn it on, you can enhance it with something called electric sport sound, which in my experience of driving this car, gives you the exact same sound that the mechanical aspects of the car makes, but just heightened or increased artificially. And it sounds really bloody good. So what we've done, I've set up two guys here, Jamie's here and my friend Irfan, I'm gonna creep up to them, stop the car, take off again, stop the car and take off, and just give you an idea, A, what it sounds outside, and B, what it sounds like inside for me as the driver. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised how futuristic it sounds, so let's do that now. Can you hear that? Starship Enterprise 
or an X-Wing or a TIE fighter or something. Cool. I mean, that is the word. It's cool. It's so different to combustion engines, but it's just cool. Now, some people will poo-poo it, and some people say, hey, it's artificial and it's fake, but look, most of our modern cars with their pops and bangs, especially the ones that I love in the recent modern era, they all have fake pops and bangs. You know, the rev themselves sound like shit, let's be honest. Another test for it. Let's try, like, a hard acceleration. Sounds really cool. Now, if I try it with sports electric sound off, what you'll find is you'd still get a similar sound even with all the artificial stuff off. Can you hear that? Just about, just about. It's the same sound, but you hear it better with electric sports sound on. How fast is this car? Holy crap, just got some airtime. That was scary. Incredible, incredible. The grip, we'll get onto handling in a minute. I'm just gonna get out of this handling sector. Yeah, I love the sound. Right, what we're gonna do is we're gonna cover just the performance, as I said, in this review. I'm not gonna be talking about charging times, range, none of that stuff. That'll come in the future when we talk about living with the Taycan on a daily basis. So I've got half, uh, essentially 50% range at the moment, 100 miles showing here. I'm in Sports Plus. That's where I'm gonna keep it on because today is all about performance. So let's start with the first one, which is the obvious one. It's all about speed. So in regular driving, we've got 620 bhp in a car that is really quite heavy. Now, we had the turbo SE hybrid of the Panamera here. And while it was exceedingly fast, most of the time it didn't really feel so because it was quite heavy it didn't really have the sound to match it either whereas this i don't know how to explain it is it the low center of gravity is it the futuristic sound is it the fact that we're sitting so much lower down in this car versus something like panamera i just drove the m340 ion here back to back and coming out of this sitting into that it feels like i'm sitting in an suv when i'm in the bmw that's how nicely low you sit in here, thanks to these footwells. I must say, this feels infinitely, infinitely quicker than the Panamera. And it feels, dare I say, it feels much faster than the Turbo S as well, even with the roof down. Getting enough of that electric sound at 150 miles per hour now. Absolutely effortless. There's hardly any noise coming in. I mean. They've done a great job here in isolating road noise, tire squeal, wind noise, but I'm getting the noise I want. I'm hearing kind of the electronic mechanical elements of the car, obviously enhanced. Speed is incredible. I don't know how to describe it. I feel like, you know, when you put a cheat mode on a game like GTA and you get one of those super silly cars that are incredible at driving fast but then equally good at stopping and it just seems superhuman like you can never have a car in the real world that does that and that's kind of what the Taycan does the acceleration if I slow down for a second and then we pick it back up it's just so instant like it hits you in the gut and then when you stop equally you feel the g-force of stopping so quickly it's superhuman it is unbelievably addictive in every way, and I love the sound. That's that X factor that so many EVs are missing. Porsche have nailed it. Fight me on this, I don't care if it's enhanced. That's what I want as a petrol head. I want the X factor. I, when I'm out of this car, I want to be missing it. I want to be coming back in it. I had this car for one day a couple of weeks ago. We couldn't film here at that time because the track had some issues. So I just had the day to kind of live with the car. And when it went back, I found myself missing it. 
I've never said that about an EV that I've driven before. I usually say that about really, really special cars that I get from press. This comes into that category of really, really special. So yes, as you'd expect in any EV, loads of speed, as you'd expect with a car with the, with the brakes that this has, the stopping power is phenomenal as well. But, you know, the Teslas can do that. Easy peasy, right? The speed. Where the Taycan is just levels and levels above is how well it handles. And that's when all the drivetrain element goes out the window because you forget about it. And the realization that hits you is that you are driving just a super fast Porsche. Now let me show you what it's like when we go on track. <laughs> First of all, as you expect in all Porsches, the steering is just so brilliant, the feel you get. But let's ignore all the PASMs and, and the PDCs and the PDVs and all the PUDs and whatever the hell it is. Let's talk about how it feels. It reminds me of 992. It reminds you of turbo in its pickup. Steering feel definitely reminiscent of turbo. You got the rear wheel steering as well, which really reminds me of that car. You could really point this car in. I know exactly, exactly where the wheels are. And it's so willing to turn in and take that line for you and then rock it out the corner like nothing else. Given the weight of this thing, the sheer weight, it should not handle the way it is. I mean, it, again, it's superhuman. Of course, of course, of course, like all EVs, low center of gravity thanks to the batteries being low down there. But then equally in other EVs, when you hit like a speed bump or something, you're immediately reminded of what the weight is or you go too fast into a corner. The car hasn't got what it needs in order to handle that weight. But that's not the case with the Taycan particularly in the Turbo S, again, with the dynamic chassis control. It's so stiff, it's like on rails. I feel like a hero driving this. It's so pleasurable, it's, it's so fun to drive fast. I would challenge you to find another EV on the market where someone has said, it's actually fun to drive fast on a handling circuit in that car, because this car genuinely is. It reminds me enough of 992, I feel myself lusting after this car slowly but surely as this video goes on. It's incredible. I love to see what the 4S is like with that reduced weight. Got some play in the rear as well in this. And then the rear wheel drive version should be interesting as well. Right, I'm going to conclude it here guys. I'm driving a car that feels like a Porsche. The drivetrain has gone into the background. I do miss paddles but I'm slowly learning the more laps I do that I don't need them. I'm getting used to when I can put the power down. Every lap I'm gaining more and more confidence. It sounds just like a normal Porsche to me. It's genuinely incredible how they've hidden the weight. It is genuinely incredible how repeatable the performance is. And it's incredible how just comfortable the car is. I think finally I'm, I'm on board with the EV thing. It's thanks to Porsche and this Taycan. It's, simply on another level to everything else. I really recommend that you guys try this car. I'm looking forward to getting it back and just wow. Can we do that just 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 one more time and just wow. <laughs> I love it. So guys I really hope you enjoyed this full review on the performance of the Taycan Turbo S. If you have please do like, subscribe, hit that bell icon I'm going to go back on the handling circuit in an EV, which not a lot of people would do with other EVs, but I'm sure most of you will once you taste just how electrified the soul of the Taycan is. This has got the X factor, the soul of a real performance car, and it doesn't matter that the drivetrain is electric. Now it's time for me to have some fun. See you guys later.